On behalf of the School Foundation, it's such a pleasure to welcome you to this session. My name's Claire. If we haven't met yet, um, wonderful to have you here for the conversation co-hosted with the Wellbeing Project. Throughout the week, we hope that you've had a chance to meet new people, reconnect with people you know, advance your work, learn something new, be inspired through the School World Forum. And this session is a particularly special conversation we're excited to have space for. Um, it's also part of an ongoing series that we are part of with the Wellbeing Project, a monthly series where uh, we come together to connect throughout the social impact space and have conversations with different guests, artists, and um, meditation guides as we think through how we can integrate well-being into the work that we do. And with that, I'm, I'm happy to introduce my co-host, Aaron Pereira with the Wellbeing Project to welcome us into the space. As you're just joining, please go ahead and enter into the chat where you're calling in from. Um, it's such a pleasure to be together again doing this uh, around the time of the school forum. Uh, just for everyone to know, this is a tradition that now goes back years, um, starting with uh, music jams, starting with um, uh, explorations that were about the richness of what it means to be human. And so very much continuing with that in mind, uh, we're really excited about today's session and to be together with our incredible uh, co-hosts who will soon be taking the road on the show, their show on the road. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, and so I'm super glad to pass um, uh, this over to uh, Parker Palmer and to Sharon Salzberg, who will be taking us into this extraordinary session on grief. Hello, I'm uh, so honored really and happy to be here um, with these incredible guests and with all of you. And I thought we could start just with a few minutes of getting quiet. And um, I'm going to guide you in a suggestion about exploring this terrain, this, this world of, of grief. And what I'm going to do is um, urge you to start by just resting your attention gently on the feeling of your breath, just the in and out breath, wherever it's appearing. And um, I'm going to say certain words, and they're the words of uh, my world of exploring this topic. And so just for you to notice, if there's imagery, if there's sounds, if there's memory, if there are other words or phrases that come up for you, or maybe not, in which case you can just rest your attention gently on the breath. Okay, so just be at ease, be comfortable. Thank you, Sharon, and, and thanks to all gathered uh, in this community to consider grief. Uh, in a moment, you're going to have an opportunity to meet our three remarkable guests today, uh, Kristen, Robbie, and Zarlasht. I want to start us out with a poem, uh, which, like many expressions of art, can draw us deep into hard topics like grief. I'm going to screen share a poem called The Thing Is by Helen, Ellen, excuse me, Bass. The thing is to love life, to love it even when you have no stomach for it, and everything you've held dear crumbles like burnt paper in your hands, your throat filled with the silt of it, when grief sits with you, its tropical heat thickening the air, heavy as water, more fit for gills than lungs. When grief weights you down like your own flesh, only more of it, an obesity of grief. You think, how can a body withstand this? Then you hold life like a face between your palms, a plain face, no charming smile, no violet eyes. And you say, yes, yes, I will take you. I will love you again. If you believe that love is an essential energy of life without which there is no life and no zest for life, 
then you also know that grief is a constant element of life. Sooner or later, everything we love will be lost to us in one way or another. Like most of us, I've learned this not only through my deeply personal losses, as in the deaths of family elders and close friends and mentors, as well as the death of personal visions, dreams, and hopes. I've also learned about grief in, in every movement for social change I've ever participated in. And it has come to me often that if I can't hold grief, I can't hold a place in trying to make this planet more fit for human habitation. For me, at age 83, looking back on 60 plus years of participation in the peace movement and the movement for Black liberation in the US, there's enormous grief in seeing how many things that we thought were achievements have been brought down by setbacks. A depth of grief that leads some people to say, this is where I came in, stop the world, I want to get off. So the deep and critically important question in front of us today in this webinar is how can we embrace the grief that always comes with a life of love? Embrace it in ways that allow us to keep loving and keep devoting ourselves to the work of love called social change. Today, we want to explore that topic with three guests whose, <clears throat> whose life experience has led them to make deep dives into grief, both personally and with others who have suffered many forms of loss. So I'm going to pose a question and invite first Kristen and then Robbie and then Zarlash to address it uh, from the depths of your own experience with a deep welcome and deep gratitude that you're here to help us today. Well, the question is, what have you learned about living with grief? What have you learned about living with grief from those grievous experiences in your own life? What have you learned about living with grief as you have worked with others who are grieving deeply as well? I'll turn first to Kristen. Thank you, Parker. And thanks everyone for joining us here today and to uh, Robbie and Zarlash for joining me for this important conversation. For me, I, um, for folks who don't know, I lost my dad early on to, in the pandemic to COVID-19. And before vaccines were available here in the United States, I lost another four family members. I knew that I wouldn't be able to function um, as I had functioned before in the world, not only because of the depths of my own personal loss of losing my dad, but because of the political and economic and systemic issues that made it possible for my mostly Latino, mostly immigrant neighborhood to get hit hardest and get hit first without many people taking notice. And so what I've learned about grief through this journey is that it needs to be expressed and it needs to be witnessed. And that's something that through the community that um, I've built through Marked by COVID is essential to all of the work that we do to prevent pandemics and to provide healing for folks is to carve out um, and give people permission to express the deep pain, the deep disappointment, and just the loss. Um, I think our society far too often, at least in the US, wants to sort of rush past that part because it forces us to hold up a mirror as to not only what we've lost, but ask the question why. But for the people that I work with, the families of a million plus people who have died here in the United States, any chance for growth, any chance for well being starts with them being able to share their story and for that story to be heard, to be respected, and to be mourned alongside them. 
Thank you, Kristen, for that and for your important work. Robbie, let's turn to you. Well, I learned about grief when my son David was killed by a Palestinian sniper. But I also learned that apparently one of the first things I said is you may not kill anybody in the name of my child. And so that was already prophetic of what I was going to do. I knew immediately that I wanted to do something to prevent other families, both Palestinian and Israeli from experiencing this pain. And I knew that one Palestinian killed my son, not the whole Palestinian nation. I think it's a choice you make after loss. You can die with your child, as many families do, maybe not physically, but they become totally immersed in the grief and themselves. You can maybe find something that means something to you and you can go and work to change that something. And for me, the something was to stop the conflict, was to try to get people to understand that only with reconciliation and nonviolence can we protect the safety of our children and grandchildren. And so virtually that is my life and that's what gets me out of bed in the morning. And with all the thousands and thousands of people who have died of late from Corona and also in Ukraine now, one could think that we are going to have to find a way to encourage, to be able to say goodbye, because the worst thing that I think is not being able to complete that goodbye. So I don't want to give advice because I'm known for giving advice, but it's not a good idea. But I will tell you what worked for me, and that is to write a letter. And write a letter to the person you lost and say goodbye, and maybe even tell them some funny things that are happening because I think part of grief is also learning to laugh because that's a bridge to a person's heart who doesn't necessarily want to hear from you. Thank you so much, Robbie. And Zarlash, please. Hi, everyone. It's such an honor to be here with all of you and my fellow speakers and, and hosts. Um, I, my name is Alash Halamzai, and I, I run an organization called AMNA, which provides support, uh, trauma support for refugees. Um, and a lot of the work that we do is about processing grief in communities that have been affected by war and conflict. Um, and what I've learned through my own life experience of uh, coming from Afghanistan and, and losing a lot at a very young age and working with communities that have very similar experiences is that grief is a privilege. Um, and in, in the space that I operate where many of the communities that we work with from places like Syria, Afghanistan, Congo, people have been under assault for a very, very long time. And they're experiencing continuous losses. Um, but even in this context, there's a hierarchy of who gets to experience grief and whose grief and suffering gets to have that space and acknowledgement. I've just come back from the Polish-Ukrainian border where we're setting up programs to support refugees coming out of Ukraine. And I was speaking to women that have been displaced from Ukraine and they were recounting their experiences of loss and, and, and expressing their grief. But what really struck me when talking to them is how much our collective compassion towards Ukrainian at the moment is, is enabling them to, to have that space for their own grief. And it, it made me think about my own community, the Afghan community, and how little space there is um, for us to acknowledge, to, to have that, to, to grieve for what we've lost. And um, so that's something that I've been reflecting on in the past few weeks about how grief is a real privilege to have that space to, to express your suffering, to, to process that. Thank you, Zarlash. It's a privilege to have this very conversation, um, to have the time and space for it. 
Sharon, have you got some thoughts as you've listened to our guests speak? I bet you do. I do, and I think it'll lead to the next um, round of conversation. So I've been reflecting that the most kind of grievous losses or traumatic losses of my life happened when I was a child with the death of my mother, the early death of my mother and the disappearance of my father and a lot of dislocation and so on. And the environment uh, in which I was growing up was one, I, I really do believe out of some kind of notion of care for me, uh, the environment was one where these things should never be spoken about. You know, door closed, now, now it's, it's a new era or whatever. And so, of course, I suffered tremendously internally and often just because of that kind of silence. And so it took a long time uh, for me to understand sort of my inner processes. And it reminded me of, um, you know, years and years later when I was already teaching, a woman coming to see me uh, for some counseling, some help. And um, she'd had, uh, you know, a horrible uh, loss with the, the murder of her daughter um, about six months before. And she said to me, my friends are a little bit impatient with me, like uh, time to get with it, you know, like life goes on, let's, let's cheer up or something. And I had one of those experiences, you know, where you just hear these words come out of your mouth. And what I said was, I think you need new friends. And then I said, you should meet my friends. They're all a wreck, you know, which I apologize to about my friends who are listening. But it, it's so hard if you have that kind of conditioning, you know, to be that honest and to be that open. And it just, you know, seems to me we all have different kinds of conditioning and pressures and there's so many ways to grieve. So I would like to ask um, each of our, our guests, you know, how you have grieved and how you've seen others grieve. And once again, we can start with Kristen. Thank you, Sharon. Um, you know, building off of that, I think um, the last two years, we've all had a lot of suffering due to this pandemic. Um, and now the war in Ukraine on top of all the other injustices that um, you know, we've been enduring as a society. And uh, for me, my main channel of, of really processing the loss of my father, the unjust loss of my father is through um, both building community with others who have experienced the same type of loss. Um, I think this is incredibly important in particular when grief is coming from an injustice or from an unjust place, especially in a nascent sort of movement. And I really think about the work that I'm doing as sort of building this COVID justice movement where it's at the intersection of racial justice, health injustices, environmental justice, the sort of nexus of this public health crisis that we're into. And um, the people that I spend a majority of my time with are folks who um, have lost a parent, have lost a child, are folks who have um, not been able to say goodbye to their loved one because of the conditions of the pandemic. They're also people who have been dismissed. Their grief has been dismissed because the pandemic wasn't a big deal or only 1% of people pass or you know, fill in the blank for what sort of horrific, uncompassionate sort of frame there is out there. And so for me, connecting with others, validating the pain and not just the loss, but the other wave of emotions that come with loss that's connected to economic and social systems that create systems of privilege it has been sort of my superpower in uh, being able to get up every single day and then seeing those folks go out into the world and talk to their legislators, talk to their mayors, talk in their places of work and say, it's not, I'm not okay. And helping us really find strength and in, in, in naming that and that I am not okay. I'm, I'm now a higher functioning not okay, but I'm still not okay. And I will never maybe not be okay. And 
I'm okay with that. I'm absolutely okay with that because I know that I am continuing to bring the story of my father and every other person who was wronged during these two years with me as I go. Thank you so much. Robbie? Well, um, the word that I drew is with 600 Palestinian and Israeli families and this extraordinary opportunity to be part of transformation for people who were filled with hatred and revenge and to allow the place for them to tell a story of their loss. And I can tell you that Palestinian women do not get much opportunity to tell their stories. And so when they first come to the parents' circle, they talk about um, the graphic details of the death, uh, where, how much blood there was, where the, where the bullets hit, where it happened. But slowly, slowly with this opportunity to tell your story, they start to talk about the people they lost. And that's the next step, I think, for me in healing. And can you imagine what a privilege it is to be able to sit and listen to somebody tell their story who never had an opportunity to do that before. 90% of the work that we do is to tell our personal stories. And in fact, even the hardest of hearts can't not be affected by listening to that kind of story. And that's the emotional breakthrough. That's the beginning of a path of maybe being able to understand with empathy, even if you don't agree. Mm. Thank you so much for your your presence and your your work. Um, Zarlash? Um, it's interesting what you said, Sharon, about your friend and this um, pressure to be okay. Um, I feel that very much living in a European country where you have a lot of pressure to to, to be fine all the time, um, especially, you know, with Instagram and all of that. I come from a culture where grief is a very collective and public um, thing that people go through. And it's okay to sort of wail and cry and express your emotions. And there's no sort of expiry date to that. You know, if you lose a child, you people, and, and I come from a community that has experienced quite a lot of loss, but it's okay to grieve that for as long as, as, as you want. For me personally, the way, you know, everything that um, Robin and Kristen have said resonates so much and that my process of grieving for what I've lost is doing the work that I do, is um, having a way of, supporting other people who have similar experiences to me to create that space and particularly for refugees where you know most people focus on the very basic needs of you know food and shelter but human beings you know our needs don't stop at that and everyone that we work with has experienced not just the loss of their homes and their language and their community and friends and children they've lost their sense of safety. So that collective, um, you know, collective opportunity to come together and to heal as a community is so important. And, you know, and, and like Kirsten said, we need to have that pain and suffering validated. And, and, and that's, what, that's what we do in our organization. We create spaces where people can come and have that opportunity to heal and to express their emotions. Um, and I know that there's lots of change makers on this call. So, you know, I have an invitation, which is how can we create more spaces for people who come from communities like refugees to, and at, from policy level all the way down to how we deliver services to allow people to have that space for grief so that we can heal. I think it's such an, you know, without it, healing is kind of impossible, so. Thank you. Parker? 
Well, I'm, my heart and mind are full of <clears throat> thoughts and questions and feelings and experiences uh, around grief. And I'm especially struck <clears throat> by the importance of storytelling and, uh, and, and the, the open conversational space that allows for storytelling. And in my case, and I hear this in the stories of our guests as well, um, th th this has meant continuing conversation with the people I have lost in, in, in my life. Um, it, that's been a very precious part of this journey with, for example, the death of my father over the last 25 years to continue to feel his presence in my life, even though when it happened, I was, I was in one of those cultural environments where they wanted me to get over it in three or four days so that I didn't have to talk about it anymore. So surrounded by that, I just started talking to him. And that has, has been an ongoing practice. I'm gonna throw one more poem into our collective discussion. It's called My Dead Friends by Marie Howe. <clears throat> and maybe I hadn't planned to do this, but since I have it up here, maybe I can screen share it as well because it's a poem that means a lot to me. My Dead Friends by Marie Howe. I have begun when I'm weary and can't decide an answer to a bewildering question to ask my dead friends for their opinion. And the answer is often immediate and clear. Should I take the job, move to the city? Should I try to conceive a child in my middle age? They stand in unison, shaking their heads and smiling. Whatever leads to joy, they always answer, to more life and less worry. I look into the vase where Billy's ashes were. It's green in there, a green vase. And I ask Billy if I should return the difficult phone call. And he says, yes, Billy's already gone through the frightening door. Whatever he says, I'll do. The, the, the poems that mean most to me about grief and the stories that I'm hearing from our guests that mean so much to me about grief are always stories in search of the life in the midst of the grief and the life beneath and around and above the grief. I don't think it's ever beyond the grief because as far as I know, the grief lives with you, whether you know it or not. So I'd like to pose a, a third question or really set of topics, I think, to Kristen, Robbie, and Zarlash about whether it's possible to grieve in ways that bring us together. This, this is a topic that you've already addressed in, in several respects, but I think, I think it's, it's an important topic to spend some time with, because in the midst of massive grief, uh, we have to find ways not only to invite people to, to name it, to claim it, but to create community with it, from it, out of it. And so here, let me make a personal confession because there's a lot in me that wants to say, why yes, of course, we build community out of those places where we are most broken and most in pain. But let me tell you the truth about myself. I look around the world in which I live right now. I look at the people who are saying how smart Putin is, how strategic, how clever. I look at the people who are saying the whole COVID thing is a hoax. And here in Wisconsin, a woman running for office who is convinced that hospitals are purposely killing COVID patients to advance the liberal agenda and that the vaccines are being weaponized to in, in, in support of liberal causes. I look around and I say, there are people in this, in, in my community, a lot of people who are, who are not respecters of death. They, they have no respect for death. They politicize death. 
they diminish death to the crudest manipulative terms. And to me, speaking honestly, that disqualifies them from full human status. That's how it feels. I know that's not a great thing to say, but it's how it feels. I struggle with that. So the question, can we create community out of grief or will it become one of the, one more thing that divides us in this highly politicized world? I'm, I'm glad to invite you, Kristen, to start with that question because <laughs> I need help. <laughs> oh, Parker, sending you love. Um, these are really hard times and I, um, I, I really resonate with what you're saying, but I also will share with you that, you know, over the course of, of the last two years, in addition to hearing those voices, I've also, through sharing my own grief, have made some of the strongest and deepest connections with complete strangers who I later learn are starting from completely different uh, positions from me, whether it's positions of privilege, ideology, background, culture. And we've started to, in our community, refer to this as a grief bridge. And I think it starts from this basis that the agenda is the recognition and expression of grief. Going back to that storytelling of helping people give them permission to share their story, witnessing that and then building community around that on an individual and then a community level, whatever that community looks like. My community is national and global and we don't necessarily have met each other face to face, but it's strong. And it's also, I've seen breaking down bridges and inspiring people to um, be able to speak up. And I think that's part of what we're seeing in our kind of larger dialogue is that some very extreme voices who are addicted to power have very large microphones. And I think for the majority of us, it's scary and not safe to be able to stand up to that because we feel so alone. And the last two years have been all about loneliness in addition to grief. Um, so I have hope, I have hope. And that hope actually comes from my losses and seeing the groundswell of uh, support in witnessing not only the loss of my dad, but something so much larger, the, the, the absolute tragedy of COVID destroying communities that were already on the edge to begin with. Thank you so much, Kristen. That, I just need to say that's an immediately helpful answer to me. Uh, I, I can kind of feel the surge of life around what you were saying in my own heart. Um, and I, I put it along with other things I've heard, everything I've heard from you folks this morning in the category of continuing to try to make meaning and purpose out of an, out of an otherwise, out of an experience that otherwise could lead you to a kind of nihilism, whether it's the experience itself or the blowback to how you're trying to hold the experience. So thank you very much. Robbie, please. You know, I, I was just thinking as you were all talking of the very first meeting that I went in East Jerusalem with Palestinian and Israeli families who'd all lost immediate family members. Of course, in those days, I didn't realize that those were the people that would understand because nobody can possibly understand what it is to lose a child. And so this gives you the freedom to really be who you are and not be the property or the bereaved mother. And I remember I sat around a table and I looked into the eyes of the Palestinian mothers and I realized something enormous that we share the same pain. There's no difference between me or a Palestinian mother or one of the black mothers who I've met or any mother for that 
for that matter, or fathers for that matter. But for me, there was an immediate link with the mothers. And I realized that the tears are the same color and that we could be such a powerful force if we stood on the stage and spoke in the same voice. Wouldn't we be an example to everybody else who can't see a way to look for empathy? And so I got this huge gift of belonging to this organization and of being able to take a local message and spread it all over the world. I don't know, half the time I've no idea where I am. I think I have, um, what do you call it, an honorary air hostess degree. <laughs> but it is so extraordinary to be able to have this privilege, as I said before, of doing work on the ground with people who trust you because you've shared the most intimate details of who you are and that's how you build trust. And that comes from the story and the first person that tells a story in a room that is safe will open the room for everybody else to share the most delicate secrets. Thank you so much. That amplifies for me what, what Kristen said, thank you. And Zara, Wait, I'm sorry, there's one other thing that I just wanted to say. Please. You know, <laughs> I always have to um, say too much. But I just wanted to ask people, when somebody cries, please don't run with tissues and water. You know, this is a huge temptation with people who are grieving because you feel a bit uncomfortable. And so I really just be there. Don't supply the tissues. It's fine if they don't look very glamorous. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Ra. There's an ancient <clears throat> theologian who wrote a lot about the gift of tears. And I've, I don't think we should deprive anybody of that gift. Uh, Zarlasht? Um, I, 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 it's the question that you posed, Mama, is such an important one. I think both of my um, colleagues here have shared how we can come together. The grief can be a bridge. And the thing that I'd like to offer is that we must come together. Um, it, without it, you know, all the things that we're talking about, the pandemics, the many, many chronic conflicts that we're embroiled in, the ecological destruction that we're experiencing. I, some of the things that, one of the things I've been aware of in the last couple of years is the grief that we feel for the environment, that many people, you know, it's sort of bubbling to the surface and, and is giving, I think, a lot of people quite a lot of discomfort. So how can we come together and recognize our own suffering and someone who doesn't look like us? So can we have the same sort of compassion and give this people the same sort of speak, space for grieving, whether they're Ukrainian or Syrian, or whether, you know, you know, whoever's, whichever community has been affected by COVID, can we do that? And I think our very survival depends on our capacity to be able to come together, recognize that we're grieving as a one um, global community. We're interconnected in a way that we can't disconnect. This is it, you know, this is the community. And if we can't come together and grieve together and heal together, um, the future doesn't look very bright. What gives me hope is that we have the capacity to do that. It's whether we can make space for it. That's the question. Mm -hmm. Right. And I, I, I think, again, Zarlash, very helpful to me personally, and I'm sure to many other people as well. And I think that that making space in the larger world means keeping space in ourselves for this same kind of holding and feeling and integrating and not losing hope. Um, it, it, it's, it, politically speaking, it seems highly possible to me that in my country, and I now express my political bias, we will be, <clears throat> we will go back into the abyss in, in, 2020, pre precisely because of all the losses that we've experienced and the demagoguery that is able to manipulate those losses into something uh, even uglier than what we've got, that's gonna require a lot of heart space in those of us who, who love democracy. 
and, and love life for everyone. Um, that's why I'm listening with great care to the witness of, of you three. Thank you. Sharon, back to you. Yeah, thank you all so much. Um, I've also been reading the chat and um, somebody put in earlier in the chat something about living with grief rather than living kind of getting over it, you know, or being beyond it. And I know uh, one of our uh, beautiful guests earlier used the word struggle. And I think that needs to be acknowledged. It's a struggle, especially if you're trying to make a difference in the world. Um, and uh, what I've seen in myself and what I've seen in others is that having that uh, sense of meaning is a, a tremendous asset in that struggle, the personal ability to keep showing up and keep caring because it's not easy. Um, and the other thing is really love. So someone put in the chat, tears are the wine of blessedness because we love. And uh, for me, that's been really crucial. Somebody said um, something like, uh, grief is love without the ordinary place to land. You know, the person is not there or the situation is destroyed or the um, ideals that once guided us that we really believed in are shattered. You know, something is gone, but the love is what is still there. You know, the vibrancy of that and the potential of that, which is why you all engage in the way that you do and, you know, and face, um, you know, what's real difficulty. It's just not easy uh, to confront and, and to open people like that. So I, I've just been sitting here thinking about that love, that the quality of love. I don't know if any of you would like to comment. Um, I was just about to jump in and 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 say that that's you know the this idea of of love is is something that was very profound to me in the moments um, after my dad passed um, and and recognizing how strongly I loved him but also how strongly I, I loved my community and the people that I grew up with who were helpless in a situation in early COVID days with no access to tests and no access to treatments and who were being told that, you know, it was fine. They weren't going to get sick. They would be okay if they did. And that wasn't true. Um, and that combination of grief and love, two sides of an opposite coin plus, you know, my convictions to, to my social justice, I had come to this work, um, actually, you know, spending a career in working to transform food systems to be more equitable and just and environmentally friendly and to not um, override local communities and indigenous peoples and seeing sort of this injustice come into my own neighborhood, um, elevated just a whole sort of kaleidoscope of care and love that I had to this planet, that there was no choice for me but to honor that in stepping forward and, and, and sharing my own story. And I think a lot about what Zarlash has called on us to do, and also Parker in this, and Robbie in this conversation of, of, of witnessing the grief in yourself um, as an extension of, of love, um, and I think a lot about as we move forward in this time of uncertainty, incredible time of uncertainty, how do we honor that? But how do we honor that in the spaces that we are entering into, whether it's the workplace, whether it's school, academia, whether it's in foundations or you know, other private sectors? It's an extension to me of the DEIJ statements that we all have, because we know the people who are suffering the most, who have suffered the most injustices, tend to be those very same people who have been traditionally overlooked in our systems of power. And so I think it's a calling. And I think to Zarlash's point, it, it's a must. It's a must. 
Thank you. Uh, Parker, is there anything you'd like to say? And then maybe I'll, I'll uh, close with the meditation or Robbie's our last, if there's anything else that uh, has come up. Well, I just wanted to say that we have this tendency to take ourselves terribly seriously. And um, something happens then, you get burnt out. I think it's terribly important to laugh. I really do. I keep saying this to everybody I meet. And when you're feeling really lousy, turn on Netflix, watch an episode of Seinfeld and go to sleep. You don't always have to be on. This is a huge task to always be on. And let's not think that we have the panacea, the universal panacea for, for solutions. I just think that hope is, is one of the most important equations in the whole quest for peace. And so firstly, I want to thank you all. And it's always such a gift to meet all kinds of people from all over the place. And even people who thought in the chat that Israelis might offend them. Allow me to tell you that um, there are many, many other people exactly like me. Don't give us all labels. You know, it's easier to find out who the person is. And if you take sides, all you're doing is importing our conflict into your country and creating hatred between Muslims and Jews. Let's try and not be that person. Be part of the solution. Thank you. Zarlash? I, I just wanted to offer, um, and it connects to what Robbie said, um, the importance of vulnerability and safeguarding your vulnerability uh, when grieving. Because um, without it, I think it's really impossible to have joy in your life. And when you're grieving and you have, you know, you're under constant assault, it becomes really difficult to remain vulnerable. And so for me, one of the things that is so important to me is to safeguard my vulnerability, my capacity to feel grief and to feel pain, because if I numb that, then I can't feel all the other things that keep me going, like joy and laughing and love and all of those things. So that is something that I wanted to share with this group. Okay, I'm going to confess, I've never seen Seinfeld, but I do, I do watch <laughs> others. I watch them a lot. Parker. Whatever works. Well, I'll help you with that, Sharon, <laughs> in, in an after session. I, I just would love to hear from you, Sharon, some final reflections on loving kindness, simply saying a deep, deep word of gratitude to our three guests and to a community on Zoom here that has supported this, this conversation, this deep dive into grief. I've gained so much from it, and I thank all concerned. Thank you. So I, I would like to uh, close. It does feel like it's way too short. It's been an extraordinary time being with you all. And um, just with another meditation, which we can do briefly, which is really offering blessing in a way to ourselves and to others. So you can sit comfortably, close your eyes or not. And traditionally, the first recipient of this is ourselves, which can feel a little bit funny, but um, it's the sense of warmth, of caring, and whatever phrases you might want to repeat in terms of what you would wish for yourself. May I be safe, be happy, be at peace, and just have that sense of gift giving, of offering. So thank you, may it be so. Thank you, Sharon. And thank you to our wonderful panel, uh, co-hosted by Parker and Sharon. Just, I'm feeling such deep gratitude for today's session. Just as we close out, I just wanted to mention one thing. Um, this session has been part of a series now going back to 2020. Um, and we've been very, very lucky to have an extraordinary group uh, to travel with. 
And it's building up to a big summit that we're hosting in Bilbao in Spain uh, at the beginning of June. Uh, and the idea really is continuing to build this culture of inner well-being in the field of social change. We're bringing together over a thousand people um, that uh, will together be exploring um, the way that our deep humanity um, can inform um, the way we are in the world and the way that we work in the world. Super, super excited about the people that are coming, about the speakers, about the artists. Art is gonna be at the heart of this and there's some extraordinary work uh, that we'll be exploring this work. So if you're interested, um, a link has just been put into the chat. Please take a look at it. And I think you might find it uh, super interesting. And with that, just to close this out and just to express collective gratitude um, and to be present for what we've all experienced today, I'd love to invite everyone just to turn on your screens and your mics. And as we check out of today's session, uh, if we could just say thank you to our wonderful panel and also thank you to everyone that's been present uh, in today's session. Uh, it's been very, very special. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. 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 Thank